morning. We're going to get into it, uh, and we are uh, excited to be here this morning. I want to say we, it's me, it's not we, it's my wife's on the Gold Coast this morning. But this is the first Sunday that we are away from, uh, well, I'm away from my church since we started. So we started six months ago. We now have a church of over 600 people, and it's uh, been an amazing year this year. And this is the first time I've been away. The first only time away, my wife emceed this morning, and she said to the church, it's the only time Joel will be away from our church this morning. And I, the reason that is, is because of relationship. And I, I said to Joel, I'd love to come and just be a part of your church. Uh, and I'm going to speak to some other churches uh, across this uh, today, Sunday. Uh, and I just want to, really, I've got a word that I believe is from God for you. A word that I believe that you can take with you and you can uh, do something with it. I, I also want to say, if you are new this morning, if this is your first time here to this church, I want to let you know it's my first time as well. The only difference is that they gave me the microphone and you can just relax. So that's a good thing. And it's good that you know, there's nothing better then on a Sunday, making it a, a great habit to come to the house of God, to be inspired, to be enlarged, to get perspective on your week and what's happening in your week. And so I just want to say you're very welcome here. And maybe afterwards I'll get to meet you as well. That'll be really cool. But I'm going to get into the Word of God this morning. Is that cool? Have you got your Bibles? I'm going to be basing uh, today's main text, so if you want to turn to it so that you're ready, uh, in 2 Kings chapter 4. So 2 Kings chapter 4 is going to be my main uh, text from today. Well, there's some very nice little red things here on this little pulpit. That's very nice. I'm just going to put that there. Excellent. And I, I, want to, uh, I want to speak into your church this morning, and I'm going to believe for you that God's going to, to really ins- in- speak to your heart this morning. And I just want to um, start by letting you know that um, h- however you walked in here this morning, that God is for you. No matter what you might have heard or maybe what you might have felt, you might have felt like things are all stacked up against you. Maybe even just walking in here to church this morning, you're amazed so far that the roof has not fallen on your head this morning. But God is for you, and He has great plans for you. And I want you to remember that in the context of the picture of this message, God is for you, He loves you, He has a purpose for you, and He wants you to know this morning that He, he loves you, He cares about you. This morning's message, I haven't got a title for, so you can just uh, maybe put there the title, that cool guy from the Gold Coast, or uh, that guy that... Um, was wearing that weird vest that I've never seen before. Whatever it is that you want to entitle this message with, uh, or maybe at the end of it, you can actually get something and go, uh, uh, you know, you can come up with your own message title. But I want to preach a message this morning. I believe it's going to speak to you. Uh, you know, at the moment, we are, uh, I don't know about you, but when I keep my calendar, I, I still stick to the Gregorian calendar, which is this traditional calendar that we would all follow. On your iPhone, on your Blackberry, if you still have one of those, you would have a calendar. But for those of uh, the people that are Jewish or Hebrew, they actually have a different calendar altogether that they have been keeping since the beginning of time. They have had one flow all the way through their calendar. And each year at the start of the, the Jewish New Year, they believe that God prophetically speaks to them through the numbers on that calendar. And just about three weeks ago, the new Jewish calendar, or the new year in the Jewish calendar, kicked off. So while we're about to, on the Gregorian calendar, we're about to start in January with 2014, they have just started their new calendar. And in the Hebrew uh, calendar, it is the year 5,774. Do you want to know, prophetically speaking, what that means? The year 5,774 technically means, in the Jewish, it's a, it's a, it's a term or a, an italicization that says alendayat. And the word alendayat means this. To come out from isolation, restriction, and a place of stagnation to a giant leap forward and momentum. That's what Alan Dayat means. So prophetically speaking, for a Jewish person right now, they are living in a year where they believe that God is prophetically saying to them, all those frustrations, all those things that have been holding them back, maybe that haven't been moving forward, they this year are believing that God is not going to just move them forward a little bit. They are going to take a giant leap forward in what God has for them. I don't know about you, but I, as a believer of Jesus Christ this morning, want to claim that over my life as well and say that this new year for my life won't be just a year that I just see a little step forward or you know, maybe a few steps forward or maybe there's some frustrations, but I'm going to claim over my life that God, you are truly going to accelerate the purposes of God in my life. I don't know about you, but that is something that's worth getting a hold of and saying, yeah, God, I want to claim that over my life. I mean, I shared with you briefly before the church that we have pastored, we have literally seen that happen this entire year. From the start of the, the church starting, our first service, we had 350 people turn up on the first Sunday. That's a good deep forward. 
And then across this year, we've seen miracle upon miracle. Only four weeks ago, we moved into our very own building that has two levels. It's an absolute miracle. And both Sundays, the last four Sundays, morning and night, full services. We have to now go to three services. And God is doing something that isn't just a little bit. It's not a, a holding in. It's not a restriction. It's not a containment. But it is like a real tangible sense. You walk into our church and you feel like God is like pushing you forward into what he wants for your life. People are seeing dreams restored to them. People are seeing amazing things taking place. Businesses, well, in the last two weeks, since I spoke the message around this topic, we did a whole series called Acceleration, using this as the principle. I'm not doing the whole message on it this morning, but I just really felt to share this. Uh, I had three guys in our church, three different stories of people who had lost millions of dollars and supernaturally in the last three weeks have had it all returned to them out of the blue. Like in situations where they had gone to court, forgot about it four or five years ago, and all of a sudden they presented with checks saying, you can have it all back. One lady lost 17 houses last year, had them all back in the space of 10 minutes. That's the kind of thing I'm seeing in our church. So I'm here this morning to declare over you that I believe that God wants to do an acceleration in this church and in your life. And if you can claim that this morning, maybe you will sense what God can do. Doesn't just take a little bit, doesn't just hold us in. But it's like a a picture of a dam bursting. It's like a a wall coming down and God doing something so quickly and so supernaturally. That's the kind of thing that God wants over your life this year. So in the context of this message, I want you to remember this, that God is at work. He wants to inspire. He wants to enlarge. He wants to take you from a place that maybe you feel like you've been restricted, maybe in your workplace, maybe in some situations that have been happening, maybe you've been crippled by debt, whatever it might be. And God, in all His glory and all His favor, wants to do something in your life, not just to take a little step forward, but he wants to accelerate it into your life this morning. Is anyone want a part of that in your life? I don't know about you, but as I speak to you this morning, I'm telling you, I'm not just saying this, I'm living it. Like our church, I just showed some of the guys the photos of our church this morning, it is like full to the brim, like you cannot, no seats left in the building this morning. God is up to something. And I just want to believe this morning that I can leave some kind of a deposit in your hearts this morning, that if you generally get a hold of this, Did you know that your church can have that kind of momentum as well? If every single person in this room got a hold of this message and said, I am going to reach out to just one person over this Christmas break. I'm going to believe to see them, uh, maybe come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. Maybe it could be just a simple invitation to the Christmas um, the breakfast that's happening. Maybe it's a simple invitation. Why don't you come to church one week? Because at this time of the year, people are very open to the whole Christmas message. It's like an open window where people are, okay, I'm okay with that. I'll come to church. And maybe just by getting them here, the presence of God is going to do something in their heart. And before you know it, maybe you have to go to three services with jam-packed walls-to-wall services. Why not? That's the kind of God we serve. He is at work. And when we just we partner with Him in the sense that we have a responsibility to reach out to people in our community, in our schools, in our universities. If we can do that, if every one of us just said, I'm going to reach out to one person, so it's not this huge responsibility, just one, one person in this room would double straight away. It's actually that simple. And that's the kind of thing I believe that God is wanting to do in 2014 across this church. He wants to accelerate and he wants to move forward what God wants for you. If you've got your Bibles this morning, I'm going to read this story and I'm going to give us a bit of a clue, a bit of a, a bit of an indicator to how God does this. Is that okay with you this morning? Up the back there, you cool with that? We're good to go? All right, let's do this. 2 Kings chapter 4. I'm just going to grab my Bible here. I'm reading from the NIV this morning. I left my Quran at home. I'm going straight to NIV. I'm just joking, by the way. We haven't built a church like that. Okay. 2 Kings, chapter 4, verse 8. We are reading about the Shunammite woman. So one day, Elisha went to Shunem. Everyone say Shunem. And a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, I know that this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Let us make a small room on the roof and put it in a bed and a table, a chair and a lamp just for him. There he can stay whenever he comes to us. What an interesting story. That a woman that is well-to-do, that is powerful, that has lots of things, has going out of her way to create a room in her house for a guy she does not know, just in case he comes by. And I want to take this story this morning and really open it up as to the purpose of God in all our life. Is that okay with you? Let me give you some context. Back uh, at this time when the Bible was written, so there was originally Elijah, then Elisha came. 
This was pre the cross, okay? So when people heard from God, there was only very limited ways that someone at this time as a, as a Jewish person could hear from God. These days, as you would agree, you could hear from you know, the Holy Spirit. You could really sense God speaking to you. You can hear from a pastor. You can hear a prophetic word. You could hear from God as you read the word of God. They didn't have that. The only way a Jewish person would hear from God was on one of three occasions in the year. There were three main uh, celebrating times in Jerusalem where it was required that every male would put down their tools or put down their jobs and they would travel to Jerusalem and go to the temple. And there they would hear from the high priests and they would hear from God. If you were a woman, it was just bad luck altogether. You didn't get to go. You literally were left out of the, the whole context of this. You, you would hope that maybe your husband heard something so that he could then tell you what he had heard and it was like a bit like Chinese whispers. But it was very hard as a woman to hear from God. The only other way that people would hear from God is when appointed men of God. So in this situation, one of the very few prophets at this time, Elisha, if he came through the town, people would know that as he spoke, it would be the word of God. So it was so different to now. We now can come to church every Sunday. You know, you might have someone give you a prophecy. You might read it from the word of God, the Holy Spirit, you know, all those different components to hear from God. Back then, it was so unique to be able to hear from God. So when this man came, this holy man, he arrived in their little region of where they were, it was a huge deal that God might turn up and speak. So let's get the context. This woman, this woman who had everything, she had, was a woman that tells us she was very powerful. Let's, let's imagine she's like the modern day Oprah. Let's just, you know, let's just say it's Oprah. Oprah has everything. There's nothing that she doesn't want for. She's a powerful woman. But this woman, the Shunammite woman, gets this revelation that even though I have everything, even though everything is available to me, even though I have power, there is still something missing in my life. There is still a need that I cannot meet. And I need to do something about making a space in my life in order for God to speak to me about what he wants in my life. So she goes out of a way to construct. She becomes a renovator. She decides to go on the block. And she goes in and she gets this house and she says, okay, there's a room upstairs or a space that maybe that would have been used for the animals or possibly something else in the house. And she decides, we're going to go up there. We're going to construct a room that could be used for many other things. But we're going to make it just a space just in case Elijah comes past and needs somewhere to stay. And maybe, just maybe by making that space, he might speak God's word into my life. Maybe. Maybe. So I'm going to spend my money, my resources... My convictions, my uh, inconvenience, maybe I could have put something else there, but I'm going to make this space just in case on the occasion he decides he might come past, he has somewhere to stay. And maybe, just maybe if he does stay, he might have God's word for my life. Even though I have everything, even though there's nothing else I want, I still desire one thing, and that's that God would speak to me. How cool, hey? So this woman, she makes this room, she makes this space just in case Elisha comes. How about you this morning? Would you say right now in your life, you've got lots of space for God? Or would you this morning, if you're honest enough, say, maybe there's just not much space at all, or maybe there's actually no space. Maybe the only space that you give to God is this two hours every Sunday. Maybe if you're honest and you really dig deep this morning, you realize I have actually been able to marginalize God to the external ends of my life and the priority or the the key space that he wants to actually have in my life is non-existent. This woman who had everything, she had all the power, yet she still recognized the fact that she needed to intentionally, everybody hear that word, intentionally make a space for the man of God to come. In essence, making space for God. How about at Christmas 2013? Have you got space for God? Like not just the average space, but you've actually made margins in your life, whether it be your quiet time, whether it be around your family dinner table, whether it be around that time where you just put the earphones in and instead of listening to Justin Bieber, you decide to listen to a Bethel worship album or some Hillsong. See, I don't think 
sometimes we think we have to create these massive spaces, but God just says, I want to invade the smaller spaces, those spaces that could be given to something else. I have, a, I have two daughters and a little son. The two daughters are in high school. Oh, not in high school. <laughs> that would be a bit weird that they're in school. One's eight, one's six, and I have a little boy called Judah who's eight weeks old. He's a very cute little thing, very little and a very cute, and he's going to be a world changer one day. But my second daughter, Summer, she's one of these kids that, how do you put it nicely, she's got a lot of energy. She's a little bit cheeky. She, she is the life of the party. Whenever she's at church, everyone knows Summer's around because she is just a, a weapon of mass destruction on the, the social front. One day, about six months ago, my wife calls me and she says, Joel, I don't know what to do. I said, what's happened? She goes, Joel, are you sitting down? I said, no, I'm not, but just what's happened? What is, I, straight away, what has Summer done? I didn't think about Taylor. She's a very good kid. She's very studious. What has Summer done? She said, I, this morning when I was getting out of the car, I realized that something had happened to our car. And I'm like, hey, what happened? What happened? And if you can imagine, we have a black Honda CRV, okay? So that's our family car. It's quite a, it's a big family sort of car. And Summer had decided that this year is her first year of school. She was doing a great job learning her name. A great job at school. She'd learned her name effectively, Summer Cave. And she decided that she was going to let the whole world know about that. And she took a rock. And she went from one end of our car to the other end. And it wasn't even like italics 12. It wasn't italics. It was like italics 72. The whole, the whole, like, you know, from the, from the, from the window to the floor, along the whole car, deep as well. It wasn't just a little, like, little, it was the deep, like, she was like, she was getting her arm into it. She wrote Summer Cave from one end of our car to the other end of the car. And that is exactly how I felt right out there crying. That's, I was like, I was like, what do you do with that? Like, I'm like, the whole length of the car. I mean, I'm telling you, two meters of Italic 72 deep. There's no way that baby boy's coming out of our car. So I'm sitting there going, okay. I said, are you sure, Ellen? Are you sure that it's, it's, it's a deep deep rock. And she's like, I'm, Joel, I'm telling you, I, I, I'm out of words. I cannot describe the anger, the pain. The, she says, I just, I don't know what to do with this. I said, okay, okay, just take me a photo and send it to me. Let me just, let me myself have a look at it in case I can buff this out. Or So she sends it to me and she looks at it and sure enough, I'm like, oh, that's terrible. Like that is, um, you to the, still to this day can come to my house and see my car with her name on it. Like it just, it's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. Now, in that moment, honestly, I could have reacted and I could have been that guy that was just, you know, like blowing up at my little six-year-old and she's this cute little thing. She would have just looked at me in her eyes and she would have looked at the little curly hair and I would have been like, ah, oh, you don't understand. It's okay. But what, what happened was between the time that she um, had done the, uh, the criminal damage to our vehicle, between that time and between the time that I saw her was about six hours because I was working. So I said, when I get home, Ellen used the line, your dad will speak to you when you get home somewhere. She's like, am I in trouble? Yes, you're in trouble. <laughs> yes, you are in trouble. Just to clarify, this is not a good thing. This is not a good thing at all. So I got home. And it was amazing that six hours between the time that I heard about this disaster, because it was a disaster in my family, and see my little girl with her little blue eyes staring at me and a little curly hair, that space, that six-hour gap, allowed me to get so much perspective on how I was going to deal with her. I don't know how I would have reacted if I'd just seen her and then it happened. I think the anger would have been so much inside of me. I don't know how I would have reacted. I'm being honest. But over that six hours, I went through a whole lot of different emotions. I went through anger. I went through sadness. I went through calling the insurance company. I went through, um, you know, every kind of possible emotion. But then I started talking to some of the guys I was working with. said, Look, this is what just what's happened. Everyone's like, oh. I'm like, I know, don't, you're making it worse. Okay, just, I know. And we started, they started to say, okay, what would you do? One of the guys was, you know, one of my staff members, he's a little bit older than him. I said, look, what would you do if you're your kids? You know, have you, have you counted this before? They're like, no, I've never seen this bad before. I'm like, what would you do? So we managed over that six hour period to come up with an action plan. An action plan where I decided that what I would do is that I would spend every week for the rest of our year on a Saturday morning, cleaning the car with her to teach her the lesson that you can't just go destroying things. And so we spent, well, probably it was about three months actually, between July and about August, or August, September, every Saturday morning we'd go out, she'd have to vacuum the car, she'd have to clean the car, and we'd teach her that lesson. And I want to tell you this because 
because I had given her space, or I had given myself space to process what had happened, I had given myself the margins to come up with a good action plan. I didn't then look back at the situation with regret. I didn't look back at it and say, oh, that was a disastrous way I dealt with it. I dealt with it in a way that I believe was God-honoring and also helped her for her future. And I think we can apply this whole thought to ourselves as well, that if we truly understand that if we give God the room and space that he needs in our life, not just contained to those little moments or those little margins, but if we actually give him the space he needs, he will fill it. He will fill it with his purposes. He will fill it with his dreams. He will fill it with his resources. He will fill it with so many different things. If only we were intentional enough to say, God, I'm going to make a room and a space for you in order for you to do what you want to do. I want to give you three things this morning. Three things that we learned from the Shunammite woman that can happen in our life if we give God the space. Is that okay? You with me? Excellent. The first one is this. Please move forward down to the verse. Sorry, my, the air conditioning, sneaky air conditioning. Let's just move my page. Please move down to the verse 15. It says this. Then Elisha said, call her. So this is a Shunammite woman. So he called her and stood in the doorway. This is the doorway of the new room she made for him, okay? The space she made. About this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. This woman had no child. She'd been dreaming about having a child. She had no child. And in the room that she made for Elisha to come and stay at, he's standing in that very doorway and says, woman, the desire of your heart is going to be fulfilled. He speaks God's, words, God's word to her. That room that she intentionally made for him. The first thing I want to tell you this morning is that when you give, when you give God space, he will birth new things in your life. He will birth new things in your life. Things that you didn't see coming. Things that maybe have felt like it could never happen to you. Dreams, desires that are so far removed. And God says this morning that if you just give me the space that I need to do what I need to do in your life, I will come and birth new things in you. What a promise. The second thing. that God will do when you create space is this. He will renew and revive dead things. He will renew and revive dead things. You don't believe me, turn with me, the same passage, to verse 18. So this same child that she has, she actually gives birth to him in the room as well. The same child she has then dies. In verse 18 says this, the child grew, and one day he went out to his father, who was with the reapers. My head, my head, he said to his father. His father told a servant, carry him to his mother. After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. It's pretty full on. The same thing that had a miracle happen in the room. He's now dead. She went up to him and laid him on the bed of the man of God, and then shut the door and went out. So let me describe what's going on here. The son, this one that was a promise of God, that was fulfilled through the man of God, he then dies on her in her lap. The dreams that she had, the, 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 the ideas, the, the resources, they're dead, they're gone. And then she says, or well she doesn't say, she takes the son and she puts him on the bed in the room that she had made for God, she puts him in the bed and walks away. We then fast forward a few verses and Elisha comes. And if you know the story, Elisha comes in and lies on top of this child and actually nose to nose, head to head, arm to arm in the room. Just don't forget, in the room that she had made for him, lies in him, sits on top of him. And eventually the Bible tells us that the child sees seven times it came back to life. God this morning wants you to know 
that when you make space for him, when you create margins for him, when you create intentional room for him, he will revive dead things. He will take things that you thought were long and gone. There were dreams that maybe that you, you saw shattered. Maybe there were things that happened. And he will come in and fill that space. And he will do something that only, only God can do. You, know, you can't do it. Only he can do. And he will say, I'm going to revive dead things. I mean, this woman I was talking to at church this, uh, this last week, she literally had lost everything. Everything was gone due to a, a simple mistake that she had signed a wrong contract. And her lawyer had missed it. And there she was. She's saying, I just don't understand how God would let this happen to me. I said, you know what? You need, to be, you need to be making space for God. She was fasting. She was doing all kinds of things. And the next thing, she gets a call and has everything returned to her. And they say, you know what? That was our fault as a law firm. We need to reimburse and make that right. We're talking millions of dollars here, not just a little bit. Four years later, God will revive dead things when you intentionally make a space for him. See, in this room this morning, you should be starting to sense in here, hey, maybe I need to start and go, go out and start collecting the hammers and start to collect the tools and start to get the, uh, the jigsaw and start to make the pieces of wood because in my heart right now, God's starting to stir something up in me that says, it's time to make space for him. It's time to start having some heart renovations this morning. It's time to start making an intentional space to say, hey God, in 2014, I'm not going to just be the same way I have been in 2013. I'm going to do something that's different. I'm going to make a space. I'm going to renovate a place in my heart. I'm going to make, it, make a renovation in my calendar. I'm going to make a renovation in the way I do things and say, God, this morning, would you take the space I make for you and would you fill it with your Holy Spirit? Would you fill it with your plans? Would you fill it with the fact that maybe there's dead things that need to come back to life? And that's the kind of God we serve that's going to do that this morning. The third thing that he will do, and I love this one, the third thing that happens when you give God space in your life is he speaks dreams and purposes into your future. You know, James 4 verse 8 says this, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Dreams of a future and a hope. See, God doesn't have plans to pull you back. God doesn't have plans to destroy your, your wildest dreams. God doesn't have plans to... What happens is we do. We, we don't make margins for God. We, we, we box Him out. We kind of push Him to the margins of our life. And God's saying this morning, if only in 2014, you would be intentional. You would be intentional about renovating a place for me. If you do that, I will fill it. Maybe you don't know how that quite looks, but you don't need to work that out. Sometimes you just need to make the space and let God do that. There's a saying I have in my church, I say, if you, got, if you make the space, he will come with his grace. That's probably a good one for Twitter. If you want to use that on Twitter, you can use that. Take that, just put it as yours. If you make the space, he will come with his grace. I mean, look at God, the Father in heaven. He was intentional with his time. He was intentional with sending his son. He was intentional with taking that time in history and saying, I'm going to send my son to earth. And we celebrate it at Christmas time as a little baby, a little baby in a manger. He's going to die. And in that time frame, in that space that he created over the term of history, each one of us comes into a forgiveness, a redemption, a sense of God's love and purpose that goes way beyond our dreams. This morning, if the band want to come back up and join me, the worship team, whatever you want to call them, the keyboard player, it's amazing. As soon as the keyboard player starts playing, it's like the Holy Spirit comes even 10 times more than it was before. I don't know why that happens. It just happens. You watch, as soon as she plays, it will be like, Poof, Holy Spirit's here. He's here already, but he's like, you know, he says, hello, I'm here as a party. That's kind of how he does things. And so I want to pray this morning for a whole bunch of people. Can you play for us just anything? Just except for karaoke, just something that's got the Holy Spirit. See that? Feel it. There he is, right there. Now, in all seriousness, I'm just going to wrap this word up. I think I've got to be finished. There you go, mate. Good to see you. I don't know about you, but I am desperate for an Alan Day a year in my life. And it doesn't just happen by accident. 
God is looking for men and women this morning who say, God, I am intentionally going to make a space for you more than in 2013. Maybe it could be when you come to church saying, you know what, I've just been coming to church now for a year or two. God, I'm going to give you the extra space by saying, I'm going to come on a Sunday and start serving in the church. I want to be a part of the solution. Maybe you're sitting there this morning and you've been a, you know, you're a musician or a singer and you're sitting there going, you know what, maybe it's time for me to actually start to use my gift in God's house by creating more space in my week. Maybe there's others of you and you walk in and, you know, all you do is you come to church on a Sunday and, and, and you know that maybe the best thing you could do is create space in your week to go to a connect group or to a small group, whatever you call it here. For others of you, maybe it's just simply saying that this morning, when it comes to my love and my understanding of God, I need to create space in my quiet space to do that. 